Are you ready for rapid fire? I uh, I have been waiting for rapid fire all day. I don't know if I told you this, but I tweaked my back over the weekend, so I've been uh, what? I've been pretty <laughs> limited the last couple of days. No, you didn't tell me that. I was unaware. I knew I'd be made fun of, so I didn't really bring it up. But okay, I pinched a nerve in my back. My sciatica is uh, is hurting, hurting. So a lot of stretching the last couple of days. Yeah. So that driveway work when you come back, that's probably out then. Or? Nope, that is not. <laughs> that is a city job at this point. Okay. City, county, one of them. If we can ever get them out here. All right, so there are a million guys named Jaden with different spellings on the Notre Dame roster. You've got J-A-Y-D-E-N, J-A-I-D-E-N, and J-A-D-E-N. Rank these guys in the importance of the spring for each of them. You've got Jaden Harrison, the wide receiver transfer from Marshall. You've got Rover slash linebacker, however, you know, specifically you want to look at it. Jaden Osbury with an I. You've got Jaden Mickey and Jaden Greathouse, cornerback and wide receivers with just the A in there. And you've got another J-A-Y, Jaden, Jaden Thomas, the wide receiver. So rank those guys in terms of the importance of the spring for each of them. So the least important to me, and I think this will kind of make things a little bit easier is Jaden Harrison. Um, okay. I, I just think that, you know, he's a transfer guy. He's primarily going to be a return specialist. I mean, he'll mix into the wide receiver room, um, but his primary, you know, goal or objective on this roster is being a return man. Um, and then from there, I think it's, you have a mixture of guys who are getting, who, who are chasing opportunities because of, you know, uh, inexperience, I guess you could say, you know, like younger guys who are ch chasing after some starting time and that's great house um, and Osbury. And then you have some guys like Mickey and Thomas who have been around a little bit longer, but are also fighting, you know, for more playing time on the field as well. And so I think that the person who has the, the, you know, rank them in terms of their most importance for the spring for them. I think Jaden Osbury has to be at the top of my list just because of the open door at the, at the linebacker position. We know Kaiser is going to get a lot of playing time, but outside of that, I think Jaden Osbury stands a good chance of being a starter if he has a really good spring. So I think at the top I have, Osbury, and then I have um, Jaden Harrison on the end, and we can kind of fill in the middle. Yeah, and that's just so that we don't each have to go through our list. I'll say I agree with you. I've got Osbury at the top as well. He's going to be battling for that rover position with Jalen Sneed, you know, just a, a, a shade off <laughs> Jaden, actually. You've got an L instead of a D there in the middle, somewhat ironically, I guess. But, yeah, so I put – I put Osbury at the top as well because he's going to be battling for that. Does he also maybe have an opportunity, as you mentioned, you know, like at the will linebacker or even in the sub package, you know, for for like that money uh, linebacker position that they talked about where you've got the Mac and the money in the uh, in the nickel package, you know, like does he fit into that potentially as well? So this is a guy who is obviously a reserve, and we had some sound a couple of weeks ago from Max Bullum when we got to talk to him about, like, Jaden Osbury was a guy who was really kind of frustrated with uh, where he was last year, even as a true freshman, and, uh, you know, kind of kind of came back with a with a burr, uh, you know, under his saddle and, uh, you know, has uh, been, you know, like, working for it, you know, wants to kind of prove himself. So I think this is a huge spring opportunity for Jaden Osbury. I agree. I put him at the top of my list as well. So after Osbury, I would likely have to go with Jaden Greathouse because mm. I, I like in, in terms of spring, I more so favor the younger guys because I still think they are trying to get more repetition and more exposure around a lot of these coaches. And so while Greathouse started fast last season, you know, he kind of tapered towards the middle due to injuries and, you know, obviously there was um, a lack, some some lack of communication going around in the wide receiver room, but I still think there are big question marks at the wide receiver position as a whole. And someone like Jaden Greathouse can step up and be in control of his own destiny this spring for you know a position 
that is largely wide open. And so I would have to go with Jaden Greathouse next. See, I put him a little bit lower because, you know, I think right now he's kind of penciled in as, you know, like the number one slot, Jordan Faison, right, you know, Faison right behind him. And then you've got Harrison as well. Um, with Faison not being here, you know, I think they kind of know what they're going to get. But I, I guess you could probably make a case for Great House being a little higher just because of the fact that, you know, Faison really, you know, showed out being the bowl MVP and all that kind of stuff. And there, and there is, even though we think that, that great house has a place someplace, and he's a guy who I, I think with some flexibility that they can move around, but with all the experience that they've added, I think maybe it could be fairly big for him as well, but I did have him a little bit lower. Did you have Mickey maybe next on your list after great house? I did have Mickey next. And the reason why I had Mickey is, you know, he's he's in a tough situation. Last season, he was behind Cam Hart. And now this season, he's fighting, you know, with some with Christian Gray, essentially, who is a very young and talented corner, you know, in his own regard. And so I, I think with Jaden Mickey, it's, you know, is, is it his time or is he going to get passed up by someone younger than him? And I think him and Christian Gray have a, a very important spring of who's going to emerge as the corner opposite of Benjamin Morrison. Yeah, and you know Marcus Freeman was saying last week that you're going to see both of those guys playing, but for that reason, because Mickey obviously is a year older than Christian Gray, I think that this is a big spring for him to you know again you know, like to kind of reprove himself because he did it a couple of years ago where he really flashed, and then you know kind of got like passed up, I guess, by his classmate Benjamin Morrison. But this is a big opportunity, you know, because Christian Gray has shown what he can really be. And, you know, even if we're going to see both of them, I think that this is an opportunity, you know, for for Mickey, you know, to 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 sort of prove that he belongs, you know, if it is going to be like a one two punch kind of situation that that he deserves to be there. And it doesn't end up being, you know, like a 20 80 split or something like that with with Gray getting the 80, you know, that that he can at least you know, keep it closer to a 60-40, if not 50-50 or whatever. I think that, you know, he really has to kind of continue to prove that he belongs to be there for sure. And I think what the only one we've got left then is Thomas, right? Now, I will say that I had Harrison a little higher, but, you know, look, you make a good point, like, you know, because, again, Harrison, it's it's great house phase on in Harrison as the slots. And I just... I find it hard to believe that Harrison is going to make that much of a dent in the slot. Yes. But again, like with Faison being gone, it's at least an opportunity for him, you know, maybe to surprise the staff a little bit with with maybe what he can do. But his main role is is definitely going to be kickoff returner. So I think whatever he can do is sort of a benefit. Like Jaden Thomas, you, you know, I think the biggest thing with Jaden Thomas is just staying healthy and continuing to be healthy. And that was the reason why he was, you know, the one just above Harrison is I think by this point, you know what Jaden Thomas is, who he is, what, what skill set he brings to the table. That's, that's no longer, you know, a confusion. I I think that, like you said, the matter with him is just staying healthy enough to consistently see snaps throughout the season. Yeah. And so you're not going to learn anything new about Jaden Thomas this spring. He is who he is. His main objective is staying healthy for as long as possible. Exactly. I think that's just flat out. The biggest thing for him is, is stay healthy because it's, it's him Colsey and then the freshman Micah Gilbert. Now Gilbert can, can you know potentially do what what some of those freshmen did last spring and and really kind of show that he deserves to be out there and you know when you just look at the body and and the kind of things that you know the that Gilbert can do he's got an opportunity but we're not talking about Micah's we're not talking about Gilbert's we're talking about Jaden's today so I think I think I think Jaden Thomas is pretty firmly at the top of that top of the heap in terms of the boundary wide receiver. So that's why I had him, him and Harrison, you know, much lower on the list than the other Jadens that we've talked about. Our top, our top and bottom were the same. 
It's just our middle two were flipped. That's it. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Michael was asking earlier, can Kate Koval be added to the Notre Dame women's team for depth during the tournament? I assume, Michael, that that you are joking because, of course, the answer is no. Because, you know, one, she's she's uh, in the middle of her, uh, um, you know, high school senior semester. But uh, I think... You know, like, you know, you know, maybe Neil Ivy needs to go scout the uh, the Irish volleyball team or or something like that and see if she can find a little length out there that maybe they can bring in just a body, you know, for a tournament. That's right. You know, give them give them something out there. Uh, DJ asking any update on Ky- Kylie Watson? No, there is no update. You know, I just I don't know. You know, considering. Where you know just sort of the way that Neil Ivy has has handled some of the, especially in season injuries in the past. I don't know that we're going to get a definite answer. I would just, based on everything that I saw and heard last weekend, I would not expect to see Kylie Watson playing again the rest of the season. So I would just sort of leave it at that. Unfortunately. Uh, Ed was asking when the blue gold game is. It is April 20th this year. All right, next question. What impact do you think Sam Hartman's extensive college experience is going to have when it comes to the NFL draft? Jesse? This is a funny question. Um, I think that Sam Hartman, here's the thing about Sam Hartman's experience. And I think that you can kind of gather this i follow a lot of kurt warner um on x or twitter you know whatever you call it these days and a lot of times he's breaking down film and oftentimes he's breaking down quarterback play and recently he's been kind of you know going through the different quarterbacks coming out of college top draft picks you know caleb williams drake may Jaden daniels um jj mccarthy you know etc down the list And the one thing that he looks at is the ability to kind of read defenses and give the, you know, uh, essentially take from the defense what the defense is giving you. And Mm -hmm. I think Sam Hartman's extensive college experience is able to provide a little bit more of that, I think, in comparison to Caleb Williams, Drake May, et cetera, because that's what Kurt Warner's biggest critique on those guys is, is it's hard to project what they're going to do in the NFL when they're not running NFL scheme. And they're also not, you know, like they're they're not they're not checking into plays or making hot routes. It's a lot of just design plays. They're not doing a lot themselves. Right. But right. As we all know, when you get to the NFL, it's all about more of reading defense from pre snap to post snap uh, hot routes, et cetera. Check, you know, checking the play at the line of scrimmage. And so I think long story short. (laughs) <laughs> Sam Hartman is better Are you than sure that, about that or, or has or is more it a long, exposure. Is it a long sto- well, or short story long. Go, I'm no. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> he has more exposure to that is what I'm getting at. And I don't, okay. I don't think that's enough to make up for the talent gap between him and Michael Penix and, you know, JJ McCarthy, Drake may, etc. But I think it's going to ultimately land him you know, a late round draft pick or potentially be, you know, one of the first undrafted guys off the board because he will make it to a training camp because he has an extensive knowledge of football. He, he at least provides, you know, even though the talent isn't all the way there, he still does know how to read defenses efficiently compared to the other guys. And I think that he can pick up an offense probably relatively quickly as well. I mean, look at the two schools that he went to wake forest in Notre Dame, you know, like he's a he's a smart guy. I think he'll be able to pick up things relatively quickly. And as you said, I think he's going to be able to, like he can he can read. You know, I, I think that he can be kind of like a Mason Rudolph kind of guy. Yes. Like he's not necessarily going to be a guy, you know. And I, like even even yesterday, I brought up uh, um, Chase Daniel, you know, from from Kansas city. And, you know, like a guy like that, who's not necessarily going to ever be a full-time starter, but he can always be a reliable backup. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that like, there's, there's like, he's, he's pretty close to maxed out in terms of what, you know, his overall, you know, ceiling is, 
But the fact that he does have all this experience between reading defenses, le- you know, learning, you know, being able to pick up the offense and, and go out there and perform it fairly consistently, you know, like a, you know, like a guy like Tyson Bajan, for example, like this, yeah. that was a D2 guy, you know, the, the Chicago Bears backup quarterback. He's a D2 guy, but he played five years in college, you know, because he got the extra year and all that. Like he threw for something like over 17,000 yards in college. Bajan did. And again, you know, and again, like he came with a lot of experience behind him. He obviously didn't play at a high level, but he got a job as a backup who could come in and, you know, run the offense when he had to when Justin Fields went down. And I could see Sam Hartman being that kind of guy, you know, again, like a Mason Rudolph, like Rudolph's already been around for five years, you know, and he's made a few spot starts here and easily see Sam Hartman kind of fitting that bill. And I think, you know, again, just to the question, that experience that he has is, uh, is going to be the reason why he's going to have an opportunity to stick with somebody. This is spring practice time. And this is something that I've been kind of thinking of for a little while. Do you buy or sell the idea of joint practices and or scrimmages with other teams during spring practice? I buy this because at a certain point, it gets very, uh, what's the word, methodic, stale, boring, just going across the same guys all the time, right? Like, when you introduce a scrimmage or some sort of joint practice, you're instantly injecting enthusiasm um, and just kind of overall uh, focus. Um, just when you introduce someone else that you haven't been practicing the entire spring, I think you're going to get more out of your players in terms of competitiveness. And I think that you're going to really test whether or not you know, so what what some of these guys have learned, because it's really easy to, to, to in spring practice to get kind of, you know, the rhythm or hang of things. But there's nothing like true kind of test experience itself. And so when you can add a scrimmage game, I, I really think it just heightens the competitiveness. And it's really fun to hit someone that's not your own teammate that you haven't been right. lining it up across for 15 straight practices. Do you worry about that at all, though? You know, it's like, oh, guys get you- – some guys might get a little bit too juiced up because it's not their own guy. and they Well, might, that's what uh, you see in some of these know, NFL training camp uh, joint practices right. or some of those fights that break out. And I do think it's because of that. You know, guys get so fired up and so amped up that it, it, it's they, they're not able to kind of control <laughs> their emotions in the moment. But I think it would be more regulated at the college level. Because in the NFL, no one cares, right? Like all of these guys are grown men, adults. There's really no repercussions. But when you do those sort of things in college, I, I tend to believe that there's more repercussions because you're still, you know, it, it, you're it's more more of the team. The NFL is obviously more of the individual. Yeah, I think it would make sense to, to you know, like you, you obviously wouldn't do it all spring long. It's not like you'd be partnered up with a team and you know running joint practice, but like. By the time you're three weeks into spring camp and you're a week or so away, you know, from your your blue gold game or whatever program it happens to be, whatever you call your spring game, like you pick a Saturday and you know you go to a team or you bring them in and you run, you know, some actual live stuff to 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 give yourself a you know kind of a more you know a better a better idea of what you've actually got. You can run some live stuff and it, and it doesn't, you know, it it doesn't even have to be tackled to the ground type stuff. You run the play, you know, the one team's obviously running their defense, you're running your offense and you just, you kind of have a better idea of what you've actually got from your, you know, from, from your guys. And then, like you said, from a player standpoint, you're, you're so used to just, you know, kind of going up against your own guys and you do have thinner numbers in the spring because you don't have, the entire freshman class and, you know, in some, in many cases, all the transfers in and stuff like that. So I think it would make a lot of sense to be able to do something like that. I I think it would be a good idea, which is why I don't think it'll ever happen because the NCAA is (laughs) the NCAA. So, you know, I see crying belly lurking in there and he's, you know, he's, he's throwing out his, uh, his crying shade 
and stuff like that. I just need you to breathe a little bit, Crying. And like, like if you have some actual, you know, constructive, you know, well thought out actual questions that aren't just negative jabs at, you know, how bad you think everything is going to be, we'll answer those questions. But, you know, it's like, we're not even going to get into some of that stuff <laughs> that he's throwing out there right now. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame men's basketball beating Georgia Tech in their ACC tournament opener after blowing a 17-point lead is blank. Is a victory. And I, I think, it, you know, whether or not you, you see 17-point lead, you see one-point lead, all that matters at the end of the day is a victory, right? Like Micah Shrewsbury and his team in year one showed up to the ACC tournament and won a game. I think that if you told people that at the beginning of the season, they would consider this season successful solely on that, making it to the ACC tournament and actually, you know, winning a, winning game, a game inside yeah. the ACC tournament. And now I think is when it truly gets fun because I, at this point, Notre Dame, Notre Dame could just play spoiler. House money now. Yep. Yeah. It, they're, they're playing with house money and they're a really good defensive team. And if I'm a team in the ACC that, you know, borderline kind of needs to win, basically you're not like the Dukes or the North Carolinas. Like you need to have a good run and potentially, you know, kind of maybe have a Cinderella upset and win this thing. Notre Dame is the last team I want to play because they're playing hard and they play really good defense. And, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not on your game, Notre Dame can definitely expose you. And so they're just, there's just so much, for them to gain right now and really nothing for them to lose. And I'm really excited to see how far they can push this thing into the tournament. Yeah. I was surprised to see both teams score over 80 points considering how well Notre Dame plays defense. I took like, the over and the spread and it, it turned out well. It, well, that turned out to be really well. Again, you know, I was, again, especially like you look at how the first half played out. Notre Dame was actually scoring at a little bit higher pace and you know georgia tech got it figured out i guess in the second half and they more than got it figured out i mean because that 17 point lead was with 10 minutes to go like you get to that point the way notre dame plays defense i didn't think that there was any way once they got up by double digits because of their defense that georgia tech was going to be able to get back in it but so much for that i mean you do have to keep scoring i guess unfortunately they were able to figure it out but you know one you may have heard this before it is hard to beat a team three times in one season, but you know, apparently even when you have a 17 point lead, I don't know, but you know, just what you said, it's just another sign of great things coming for the program because there aren't a lot of teams who could go through a seven game losing streak and losing. I think it was like nine out of 10 games, you know, at one point, and then come from that, to really turn the corner and win five out of six games, some of them by, you know, by some pretty decent teams. And let's not forget, like they beat Virginia earlier in the season and Virginia is the number three seed at the ACC tournament, but then they get their doors blown off by North Carolina. And then they, you know, they give up the big lead today and they still come back and win a game like this. And I just, I, I feel like for all this team went through when you look back at that seven game losing streak and a, a lot of close games that they lost in there, I think a lot of teams, lesser teams would not have been able to muster a comeback after you blow a, a big lead like they did today. So I think, you, you know, obviously you have to give it to Micah Shrewsbury. You've got to give it to the team that they are able to do it. You know, and again, it's like this, this was really, you you kept thinking early on, man, are they are they ever going to be able to turn a corner and at least, you know, win a few games, have something to feel good about? And I think that they've got a lot to feel good about. Just just the fact, like you said, like they were able to win an ACC tournament game. And I think that they've still got a chance to to win one or two more before it's all said and done. I don't necessarily think that it's over with. So. Johnny says, I know one thing, this version of Irish men's basketball would beat the November, December version of themselves by 50 points. I think that that's, that's absolutely right. That's for sure. D-Rock says, uh, Notre Dame versus Wake Forest tomorrow, round two, 2.30. Good luck. Go Irish. Were you going to say something? Well, now it just kind of, it, it gets really tough now because they're the team that's going to be playing from beginning to end every single day until, you know, they kind of catch up. 
and they're just they're, they're going to be worn down right but it's just kind of how what i was trying to talk about last week with louisville and how you know they got emotionally amped up to kind of come back and win that game i think it was against miami or boston college talking on the women's side and then having to play notre dame you know the day later like that that just takes its toll on you you getting you know into these games getting invested into these close games and then having to come back up you know come back out the next day and ramp things back up yeah crayon says are you guys going to be excited about eight and four no you know i'm if if kansas goes eight and four i will be very disappointed because i feel like lance leopold has something building there and eight and four quite <laughs> frankly would be a disappointment if you know if if that's what they end up next season. So I would not be excited about eight and four following the Kansas Jayhawks. They uh they're due for a come on season come on Brian you got to have something better than that man you got to have something better than that's weak that's just you know oh I guess what my thing with crying is is what is his constructive criticism you know I. Recently, I, I kind of had. You're going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I um, I was out doing some work, some field work, and these guys were. I was, you know, I was, I was basically out there inspecting them, drilling, kind of these these what are called borings, right? And these guys kept telling me why they couldn't do something, why they can't do this, why they can't do that, but they never provided a solution on how we're going to, you know, fix the situation or what their solution would be to enhance things. They only want to tell me why they can't do things or, and it's, it's, it's funny because they know that's not an option. Like I can't go back to my boss and say, Hey, we're not going to do this because you know, we just don't feel like it. So when I'm talking to crying belly here, I just want to know what your solution is. Why you, you right. constantly say, what's the actual solution rather than just pooping all over everything. I was trying to, you know, come up <laughs> with the, uh, the good way of saying it, you know, like what's, What's the actual salute? What's the actual answer rather than telling us what all the problems are all the time? Good point. Good point. If you tell me why you can't do it, tell me what you can do. Exactly. TD4ND asks, have there ever been three better head coaches leading the football, men's basketball, women's basketball programs at the same time? Now, they're all three really good. Don't get me wrong. But let's not forget, you know, like we did we, we did have a Hall of Fame women's basketball coach who was here before, who is, you know, Neil Ivey's mentor, obviously, who, you know, won a couple of national championships that, you know, one of them just six years ago. And it's actually kind of amazing that it's actually been six years at this point. But, you know, you had that just a couple years after, Mike Bray, who is the program's all-time win, you know, like those are the two programs all-time wins leaders. And he did get the program to a couple elite eights. You know, was everything perfect at the end? No. And you do have a guy, you know, who was not the most likable guy who got the program to a couple college football playoff appearances and a BCS national championship game. So um, in terms of pure likability and you know, early success, I would say, no, that, you know, that there are not three better, but, you know, again, opinions may vary on what you thought, especially of the head football coach, the last, well, and even the men's basketball coach, but you did have three pretty good ones, you know, like in a, in a consolidated period there, you know, like Muffet won a national championship in the same year that uh, BK got him to the college football playoff, right? So, like in that year alone. I don't know. What do you think, Jess? I think that the three head coaches currently is one of the most young, but, like, potential-filled trios in the country. I, I think all of them are kind of – you know, they're all starting relatively fresh obviously high Neil upside has, high ceiling yeah but they're still getting very like it's we're comparing them to people who were at notre dame for a very like muffet and mike bray were at notre dame at, for a long time right and these 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 coaches are just getting started even brian kelly was here for a long time when you think about you know the lifespan of college football coaches so 
do am I eager about you know how young they are and how relatable they are and how much promise there is? Sure, but there's still uh, ultimately a ton to prove before you can say they surpass you know Mike Bray, Muffet McGraw, Brian Kelly for the reasons that you mentioned. Those those coaches achieved a lot of things, and and while I don't think that you know I think that Neil and Shrewsbury and Freeman are going to achieve things, but they're just getting started. It's it's right. I think what what I'm ultimately getting at is head coaching is is like a marathon. There's a lot that goes into it. There's you know, and these these coaches are still relatively young. Yeah, it's still. I mean, there there are a ton of similarities between them. You know, between like the personalities and recruiting and and everything else. You know, there's 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 so much to like about all of them. You know, but I think you're right. It's still it's still largely you know because Micah Shrewsbury even is is very early in his head coaching career. He obviously has been a coach for a long time, but he's still really early in his head coaching career. So uh, it's it's still a lot of upside really for all of them that's still out there. They've they've all done some good things in a short amount of time, but there's still a lot of ceiling for all of them as well, which is which is very good for all of us, you know. So like again, like if you if you came at it from that direction just in terms of the upside. So Cryan's solution is something that is completely unrealistic. Hire Jeff Rom for 2021 <laughs> and start in jelly. Stop pumping up ACC. Nobody's hyped by the media. Okay. What is, uh, I know you, you have some opinions about Jeff Brom, don't you? Not specifically. I mean, I thought for some reason, not that you had like anything crazy to say about Brom, but I, I just can't, I thought there was something, you said he's he's the Louisville guy, guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Former former Purdue, right? Guy. How about NFL? NFL free agency period open this week. It's been a crazy lot of movement so today. I know. Which is the bigger quarterback move, though? Russell Wilson to the Pittsburgh Steelers or Kirk Cousins to the Atlanta Falcons? I would say Russell Wilson to the Pittsburgh Steelers because Kirk to the Falcons, I mean, is it a move? Yeah, but like Kirk, Kirk Cousins has like one playoff win or two playoff wins in his 12-year span. You know, Russell Wilson has a Super Bowl under his belt. And more importantly to me, the, the Falcons are a m way more stable organization than the Steelers are right now. Like the Steelers are one of the best organizations in football. And you're looking at a guy like Mike Tomlin who just goes consistently 500 or better all season. And so like the framework in Pittsburgh is much better. You have a much better GM. You have a much better head coach. You have a much better defense. You have pieces along the offense. I, I just think it, it makes for a better recipe. And, you know, in, in terms of like last season, look at the, the Steelers made the playoffs with like mediocre quarterback play and a it, really good defense. The defense they got were ten better. and seven with Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph last right. year, and, and so the, the defense got better. Watt is going to be healthy again, and I think you upgraded at quarterback. If you're the Steelers, you go into this draft, you pick up a couple more offensive linemen to protect, you know, Russell Wilson. You maybe grab some guys on the defense, and I mean, we could be talking about a team that could potentially win the division. In my eyes, you know, the Falcons yeah. they don't have a good defense. Obviously, their their organization is crappy. They're going through another head coach. Um, they don't. They can't be on the same page of what they want to use their personnel with, aka Bijan Robinson, Kyle Pitts, etc. And so I just there's too many question marks around the Falcons, and then the Steelers are just like steady Eddie. You know what you're getting with them consistently. I mean, the Falcons are fortunate that they're in a bad division. None of the teams are good, right? Yeah, it's the NFL, so that could easily change within a couple of years because, you know, that's that's happened before. It happens all the time that, you know, because of the period that we're in right now, free agency and the draft coming up, things can change pretty quickly. But I mean, I just think the Falcons ceiling is really you know, okay, you got Kirk Cousins. They're basically going to become what the Vikings were because that's what, you know, Kirk Cousins, they're they're going to be better because they've got a better quarterback, but they're not going to be legitimate contenders for anything. All you're, all, all you're going to do by signing Kirk Cousins is 
be a little bit better in the immediate future and cost yourself what would have been a much higher draft pick by signing Kirk Cousins. But right. I think you're right with the Pittsburgh Steelers because of the organization they had, because of the fact I still don't know how Mike Tomlin got that team to 10 and seven and got <laughs> it's into incredible. the playoffs this year. I know. I mean, consider too, like they played in what I would argue the toughest division in football with the Ravens, the Browns themselves, like three playoff teams came from that division last season. And it's not like they had a week out of conference schedule either. So to go 10 and seven, like you said, with Kenny Pickett at the helm, like yeah. it's, it's kind of unbelievable. Yeah. He can, th- the Steelers, and you nailed it with the D, like they can basically kind of follow the formula that Pete Carroll had when Russell Wilson was out there in Seattle. You probably need another receiver, you know, like at least a receiver or two. But I, I think that they can, that they, they, like, is even though that division is better than the NFC South that the Falcons are in, the fact that the Steelers got to the playoffs this year. Again, with Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph, now you add Russell Wilson. I think that they've they've got a chance to win that division, and you win a division and and get a home game or two during the playoffs, and you've got as good a chance of anybody of of making a run. So, well, especially an experienced quarterback, he like right. Russell Wilson has more playoff right. experience this than is the, Cousins. This is the kind of move like we were talking last week about: is he a Hall of Famer? Or not. This is the kind of move that if they they get a couple of pieces around him and you know make a little bit of a run, like I, I realize he's on a one year deal right now, and he's gonna you know he he'll cost them more actual money if they decide to keep him. But this is it's the kind of move that if it works out this year, they're gonna keep him around next year and he's got a chance to do what he talked about where, you know, like, Hey, uh, I want to, I need to get to a couple more Super Bowls. I need to win it. You know, that, that kind of thing. Like he can, he can change his legacy potentially if he stays in Pittsburgh for a few years. I agree. And the the crazy part is I would love to be Kirk cousins. You want to know why? Cause he gets paid market value for, for quarterbacks in terms of money. But there is no expectations for him comparatively at the quarterback position. Like when Kirk Cousins loses, I don't think he gets buried, but he still makes like top tier quarterback money in the league. And so it's like he gets paid to basically go out there and win games, but not win the games that matter the most. And it's, I don't know. I just, I know he's not trying to lose, obviously, but he just gets a lot of money for being just kind of above average in my opinion. Yeah. We get it crying belly. You 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 love backup quarterbacks. You're you're not very unique. I mean, the world loves backup quarterbacks and apparently you have a love affair with every backup quarterback. <laughs> so, it's like <laughs> You've said enough. I'm not putting it up on the screen. So, with the Patriots uh trading former first round draft pick Mac Jones to Jacksonville for a sixth round pick. Do you buy or sell Mac Jones as an official bust? I do buy buy Mac Jones as a starting quarterback bust in the NFL. I mean, there's a reason why he got traded to be Trevor Lawrence's backup. And I'm pretty sure these guys were drafted in the same draft class, right? So it's not even like, or it may be a year apart. Like they're not, they're pretty much the same, you know, age-wise quarterback. And now he's backing up a guy that's, you know, relatively in the same position as him. So if the writing isn't on the wall, then I don't know how else to say it because, you know, other teams would have been calling. Minnesota would have been like Minnesota is expected to sign Sam Darnold. You're telling me Mac Jones can't get a starting, you know, job opportunity compared to Sam Darnold. Again, I think that, you know, with the movement at quarterback this offseason, um, Mac Jones not getting an opportunity at some of these spots desperate for quarterbacks and then signing to be Trevor Lawrence's backup. I think it's, you know, clear indication that he's, he's pretty much become a bust. I mean, it, it didn't help him that he had a defensive coordinator and a special teams coach running the offense in his second year in the league. But at the same time, you've gone from, 
being drafted in the middle of the first round by the New England Patriots to now you're going to Jacksonville to be a you know a backup for a guy in in Trevor Lawrence who was you know also drafted in the first round not that long ago you know so it's you're 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 being traded to go be somebody's backup I don't think that there's any way around it I, I think that you have to consider that a bust you know like maybe maybe his career takes a turn and he ends up someplace within a couple of years but you know there's there's a lot there's a lot of unknown out there in in terms of how that happens for Mac Jones so I think for right now you've you've got to say it's a bust but you're being traded for a sixth round draft pick you were a first round draft pick three years ago you're being traded for a sixth round pick to go be a backup you know, so that I don't is think some serious any... depreciation. Yes, in a very short amount of time. I will say, though, you know, Trevor Lawrence has battled injuries the last couple of seasons. So I, I love the move if I'm Jacksonville. I basically have a guy that's like, you know, he's on the cusp of being a starting quarterback. So if something happens to Trevor Lawrence, you have a great insurance policy if yeah. you're Jacksonville. It's a great I mean, move he'll have an opportunity. Yeah, and I mean – they're they're probably you know worse guys to go play for I guess than Chris Peterson as well, you know. So, I mean, look at who Chris Peterson won a Super Bowl with in Philly, right? He won a Super Bowl with Nick Foles. Where's Nick Foles right now? But so yeah, he'll. Ha I mean, crazier things have happened. You know, like look at. Uh, this is before your time. Look at, you know, like, look at Scott Mitchell. You know, he turned, you know, and um, look at Brock Osweiler. You know, just just to name a couple of guys who did what you're talking about. Starting quarterback gets hurt, and they parlayed that into the next big contract and, you know, on to be a starting quarterback someplace else. It could – it. So again, my point is it could still work out, but for right now, I think you've got to consider him a bust just because of what you said, the depreciation in a very short amount of time. You've gone from being a first round pick to trade it for a sixth round pick. There's just no way around it right now. Well, that is going to do it for tonight. We started off with some recruiting talk. We finished with some quarterback talk and a little bit everywhere in between. We even had some crying along the way. We will be back tomorrow, of course. Always glad to see you. Bring your questions. Make them legit questions. Come on, crying. You've got 23-ish hours to come up with some legit questions for the mailbag show <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> All right. All right. As long see, I, I think that I think that he I think that he revels. I think crying revels. In his uh, BS quit, just 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 like to throw curveballs at us. Keep us on our toes. That's right. Making sure we're sitting fastball, but ready to adjust to that off speed. That's that's exactly right. Tommy Gunn's just getting here. Tommy Brian posted the uh, the call the radio call from the end of the ACC championship game on the boards today. I tried to post it, and for some reason my account wouldn't post it. So Brian posted it for you there we can't play that stuff because of copy we've had so many issues on youtube with the different copyright materials so brian posted it on the boards today if you want it so go for it we will talk to you tomorrow have a good one hit the like button before you leave subscribe rate and review we'll talk to you tomorrow ivy nation sports talk